Hi, and welcome back to VM End to End, a show where we have a VM skeptic, myself, and a VM enthusiast or a VM enthusiast come onto the show to talk about why VMs are cool, interesting, and useful for a cloud-native future. Last time we talked about reasoning about reliability, but I feel like I still don't know enough to actually do anything with it in the real world. So we've brought Steve and Brian back on today to help hammer that out. Hi, Steve. Hi, Brian. Thanks for being here. Hey, Carter. Nice to be here. Glad to have you. Brian, I got to start with you, buddy. After last week's episode, do you think I know enough to actually go and like take a small SaaS offering and go from like three nines reliability to four nines to maybe five nines? So I think we've got a lot of the components. We talked about, you know, some of the patterns that are common. Um, we, can, we can dig into that a little more as well. But, you know, the the question is kind of like, when and how? So what if we got a little more specific here? Like, what, what kind of app are you imagining, you know, building? Okay. Let's, let's go with the payment processing app. Uh, so it's a SaaS application. It's going to exist in the cloud. People do payments. Um, right now, that's mostly what it's going to focus on. I, I guess it's, to be honest, I don't even know how to reason about how reliable that is by itself. So I guess we should start there. Steve. Yeah, this is a this is a good place to start. Like I, I think using uh, in, in SRE we call this a non abstract systems design problem, which which is the best way to do it. And I I think um, th if you think about this, like you're you're building a system on your laptop probably, or on your you know your desktop. You're you're you're, you're getting it functionally correct first, and then you have mm -hmm. to think about like how much do I want to invest in into it in order to scale it up to have it like do something for someone else. Cause like having it just like run tests on your laptop doesn't really make you a lot of money. Doesn't do much good for society. You want to get it out there, right? You want to put it into production. And so what you really have to do is think about like, well, you know, how, how reliable do I want it to be? And the answer should always be just reliable enough, right? That's kind of a, a, a jokey way of, of responding, but like Think about like, you know, who your customers are, like, what do they really need out of this? So you're talking about a payments processor, right? So like, who mm -hmm. are your customers? Like, is your customers like your friend who, you know, sells bracelets at the farmer's market? Or is it like a fortune 500 company who's like going to be like throwing, you know, transactions at you all, all the time from around the world? It's going to be very different situations. You know what I mean? Okay. So I love, I love this, uh, specific thing. So it's always a business kind of trade-off or a goals kind of trade-off is the, is the takeaway here. Totally. Um, do you have, do you have any like rules of thumb for how do you, how do you know? It's because of business thing, they care about like money and time. Like how, how do you know, like when we're moving between these thresholds, how much is that? We don't have a lot of good data. It's more just like a, a, a sense, you know, like, um, but the, the, the rule of thumb that we use is that every additional nine you add to a system is going to cost you 10 times as much as the last one did. So if you move from like 90% available, just like running on your laptop and you close the lid and it's not available anymore to moving on to the cloud where the VM, the single VM that it's running on is like 99 or actually more like 99.9% .9 available. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's going it, to, it takes more effort. And, and the, the way to reason about it is really like uh, 10 X per nine. So, um, that's yeah, huge. it's a big deal. That is, I like I like this little simple like heuristic for me to reason about it, uh, but I guess I'm still a little bit lost in like like take the internet, how reliable is the internet? Can we ground it uh, maybe these nines in and just like you know a simple like browsing the web kind of thing? How reliable is that? Yeah, um, great question. Um, have you ever turned off your phone? <laughs> Rarely, but yes. <laughs> yeah, like the battery dies sometimes, right? Like like phones kind of like lose connectivity. Like you ever been in a dead spot? Like maybe, mm -hmm. maybe sometimes, right? So like your phone doesn't have 100% reliability in terms of letting you do stuff on the internet. Um, so if you think about it that way, like if you're building a system just for yourself on the cloud, you wouldn't want to invest in making it five nines reliable because like your pipe to that service is over like your phone and, and like, you know, cell towers and stuff. And you're going to be driving through a tunnel sometimes. And so like, why make a five, nine service for a three nines tunnel? And this, before you go too far with this analogy though, the, the, the reason why we start to, um, have higher availability is because a lot of these services are actually for server to server communication in, in a data center where they have much better connectivity than you do between your, your computer or your um, phone and, and the service. And the other part of it is like, 
most of the time you have more than one customer. So like if my connectivity to the service is no good, most of the other people's service is actually still good during, during that minute or during that second. Right. So you really do want to have for like these high end services, you want to have them pretty highly available, but you have to think of the big picture. Like who's the customer, how many of the customers are there? How often do they expect it to be up or not? Um, and the last thing you want to consider is like, um, your service or like your business or whatever is probably made up of a bunch of different services. And so if you have many endpoints that your service might, or that your, your customer may hit, some of them might be super important. Some of them might be way less important. So if I need to like sign up for a new account and it's down, like I can, I can retry, not a big deal. But like, if I'm sending you like thousands of transactions per second, and I want you to like, give me money back, that should probably be more up than, than the sign up flow. You know what I mean? Okay, so this makes sense. So we're 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 building this kind of more reliable system out of layers of less reliable bits, and because we have lots of users and or business need to do it, but like, so we talked about a little bit of it. Like in the docs, you can find out roughly how reliable a VM is. But when you start to build these shapes on top of that, how how do I know even roughly, you know, kind of how reliable a particular pattern that I've you know built is? you know, load balancer in front of a managed instance group or something? Yeah. Um, great, great question. Because uh, most interesting businesses, at least that I know of, are not running on a single VM, right? They're not just like one mm -hmm. thing. Um, and if you look at the cloud offerings, there's all kinds of stuff, you know, there's like PubSub and databases and all kinds of stuff. And your job as uh, like a, you know, an architect or a designer or, or an engineer at a at a company who's using the cloud is to come up with what we call an architecture, right? So this is, this is the set of services that all kind of stick together. Some of them are like you, you put code onto a compute platform of some kind. Another one is like you put a schema onto a database or a data store of some kind. Um, sometimes it's like a message passing. So you have to define the message queues. Or, so th this, this is your architecture. So the, the trick with architecture is you've got a whole bunch of components and you can compose them in, tons of different ways. And some of them are complete right. disasters, right? Like some of them do not work well. Um, so now, uh, y y the, the question you asked is like, how do we know if we're building a good one? And just like any software development, uh, the, the best plan is, to, is to use like a, a, a well-known pattern. Um, so we have like these design patterns in computer science. We have similar design patterns in, in cloud architecture as well. So there, there's actually a paper that uh, came out um, sometime this year, a while ago, and it was um, about the, we, we call it the deployment archetypes in cloud. Uh, and it gives you a couple, uh, like, I think there's like six or eight different models. And, you know, it starts off simple, like, you know, build one thing in one region and, and, it, and it builds up from there. So uh, some of the more common architectures are like, if you have a stack of services and by services, I mean like, you know, your, your web server and your database and um, things like that. You can have one stack in one region and one stack in another region and like a load balancer in front of those two things. Um, and you can get really complicated beyond that. You can, you can have um, things like failover between those two be automated. You can have like hot and cold. You can have hot and warm. You can have hot and hot. And you can have like more than just two, right? You could have N different mm -hmm. deployments and have them all be active at any given time. And you can, you know, charge your customers across them and all that. So um, take a look at that paper. It's not... Um, like GCP architecture specific, it gives you the pattern though, that, that lets you know what you can get out of this, this archetype. I, I love that. And I, I love just learning general principles for how to architect and design systems. So I'm definitely going to check that out. But now this kind of leads me to this question of calling back something you said earlier, getting a little less abstract. Uh, if I were to take my payment processor application, it was, you know, just for myself and my friends before, now I've got my first big customer and they, you know, they're going to throw thousands of uh, receipts and invoices at me. What, what, like, how do I start analyzing going from where my offering is at to where it needs to be now to meet these demands? I love pinning it to, a, to this real problem. And, and the, the, the pattern you're talking about where you start with a few customers and you slowly grow, um, and you start to make like business agreements with more customers that is common across all everybody, right? This is, this is totally how businesses grow. Um, and it's the right way to do it. Cause you don't want to start in your garage and build like enterprise software and expect it to be like, you know, you're going to spend 15 years building this thing before you have your first customer. So, so growing with your customer demands is totally the right way to do it. Uh, in terms of 
actually getting you to be able to like land that contract with you know a big co um, and and handle the you know the five nines or whatever it is that they're you know putting in your contract. Um, th- this takes a lot of what we call like resilience engineering or reliability engineering. Um, the way to think about it is that you're going to be building what we call a platform, and this is going to be a platform of capabilities. So these capabilities are going to be technical things like you can deploy code to your to your services you know quickly and effectively and safely so you've heard of ci cd for example like a ci cd um, pipeline is a set of capabilities in your platform Uh, other things like observability and monitoring so being able to determine like what is going on right now like why is this one weird thing slow like being able to look at a graph and being able to like drill into it and being able to like check out you know a trace or like a profile of a live running system and being able to understand it like having your team be able to like grok what's really going on under the covers and use the tools that they have at their disposal. This is all part of your platform and you're building out capabilities as a team to, to be able to like run this super complicated, complex system. Um, and the more capabilities you have, the, the better shot you have at, at achieving it. So if we want to be able to handle our requests from kind of BigCo coming in, like everything downstream of that needs to be like h- highly reliable to the same same degree, right? This is this is a great like um, the answer is no <laughs> like it's it's one of these surprising things where your what really matters to your business is the front door right so uh, you know Bigco has a contract with us and whenever they send us a thing we have to be able to respond within some amount of time but does that mean that like right. the database behind our API needs to be like six nines and like the infrastructure that that database is on needs to be like seven nines and then like does the power supply behind that I've architecture never even heard be these nines like 19 <laughs> nines like what's going on this is this is untenable right <laughs> Um, and the answer is totally no, like that is not the case. Um, so this is, this is good news. So you're able to, to, to build things that are more reliable on top of things that are less reliable. This is, this is like a general abstraction that, that you can achieve. So if your front door, you want it to be five nines, you can get away with having like a four nines or even a three nines backend. And the way you Mm. do that is through some resilience capabilities. So like a really, really simple one is purely, uh, adding retries to your system. So if your front end is up and your back end is down briefly, when your front end makes a request to your back end and it goes, well, error, instead of like returning the response to your, you know, the, the customer that you have a, an agreement with, like, I don't know what happened, like that's a bummer, just wait, you know, just, just wait for 200 milliseconds or, or some amount of time and try it again. And if it still doesn't work, wait a little longer. So uh, as long as you're not exceeding some sort of like contractual deadline, you can wait all day and you can still give back a correct response and the customer will see that as a success. So this is another form of how we kind of hide errors behind layers of abstractions. And it's, it's basically you're trading off in this case, you're trading off time for reliability. And if that's okay with your business, do it. It's, it's just another like, you know, tool in your toolbox. I love this idea of basically planning for the imperfect. We talked about this when we talked before, uh, and I'm sure there's a bunch of different avenues that we could go and look at this, like uh, like geography. There could be points of failures there, or like you said, with time, using time as a trade-off. Um, the thing I'm, I'm really curious about is it sounds like there's a lot that goes into this. You talked about a team of people having to be involved, and you yourself are an SRE. So it seems like there's more than just technology, and I've been very focused on that. But there's there's also people involved, and, and maybe there's even other elements involved in this reliability. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, uh, we, when we talk about you know large systems, we tend to say you know people, process, and technology. So this is a, a great example of it. Um, so being able to uh, understand a system, uh, improve the system, and build the system is it's it's being done by humans, right? And um, the the model that that Google came up with is called SRE. So a lot of these principles that Google used to, to build these systems out and to, to scale them up and, and not burn out all the humans in the meantime, um, has all been written down. And like the, the specifics of, of what Google SREs would do in the past inside of Google, um, don't apply directly to what customers would do. Cause it's like an entirely different system. And like, you know, customers aren't running web search on Borg or anything like that. Right. They're running, you know, payments processors on Kubernetes on, you know, cloud. Um, but the principles are actually the same and the principles can be applied, uh, anywhere They're They're totally consistent. So, um, all of this bundled together, um, not just the tools, but also the, the, the process and, and the, the culture, right. You know, how the, how people work with each other, uh, we kind of bundle that together as, 
as SRE. Um, and so it, this is, this is, uh, there, there's a bunch of books out there that you can get that, that explain all this. Um, and it's, it's becoming more and more popular. So awesome. So we'll definitely put some, some links to the SRE books and, um, the article you mentioned earlier in the, in the show notes here. Um, so we've got like, as far as doing this, like when you want to actually like kind of push your app, like up, you know, to another threshold of nines, um, we've got, you know, the people process tech part. And then we've got this, you know, reliability patterns. And some of those patterns I, I think are built into the system. Like we talked about last time, you know, that like are kind of in the VM abstraction. And some of them are things we have to handle with our app architecture itself. Does that sound fair? Totally. Um, you, you know, you can, there's always the idea of build versus buy. And, um, a lot of these systems you're just kind of getting out of the platform. So these capabilities that I talked about, um, if you're running on-prem on machines that you bought, you know, a couple of years ago and you're running, you know, your own software on them, you're not going to get live migration out of it. You could build it. It might take a while or something like it. Right. Um, but if you, instead, if you kind of take that concern and you hand it off to cloud, you get this capability. So, um, there's a lot of things out there that you can kind of get a product, right. And that gives you that capability for your platform. And now you can do that thing. Um, another similar one is like, if you have the, a layer seven load balancer, a global L seven load balancer, you're able to siphon traffic for, from one region to another, like kind of magically. It's amazing. And, and doing this like on the wild west internet is really hard because it's like you got to deal with different autonomous systems and bgp and dns and all this crazy stuff but like with um google's l7 load balancer it's pretty straightforward and you take advantage of this massive set of of systems out there this this front end technology that that google uses for its entire um set of services i've got to thank you steve and brian this is my first time d diving into sre principles and the thinking behind reliability and so I learned so much, whether it's about the people and the process and the technology, whether it's about having uh, non-abstract or less abstract like architectures and really thinking through it. Uh, so thank you. I'm going to definitely check out that, uh, that uh, paper about all the different patterns. And for people listening at home, if you check that paper out, tell us in the comments what you liked or didn't like about it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.